Patriot Gardens, and today's topic is holiday plant care. I'm Chris Postwaite, and I'll be talking to you a little bit today about some of the more common holiday house plants we have. I'm coming live to you from my sun porch at home today. Um, as you guys can see out my uh, front door here, we've got a nice snowy landscape, so I couldn't think of a better day to talk about holiday plant care. Um, I know a lot of us get holiday plants, and it always seems to be a, a big issue in January what to do with those holiday plants. I always kind of laugh to myself as I drive around the neighborhoods on trash day in January and February. You'll see the wilted uh, poinsettias and holiday plants in the trash sticking out sometimes. I always sort of feel bad for them a little bit. So why is it important um, to uh, have holiday plant care? Well, a few things uh, comes to mind. The, the greenhouse industry sort of treats holiday house plants as disposable commodities. Um, the bulk of people are going to keep them until the flowers fall off and usually just toss them in the trash. But there are a few of us out there who do like and take enjoyment and do like to keep our, our plants going year after year and take pride in that. And maybe you're one of those people who have always wanted to, but you wasn't really sure what you needed to do. So uh, holiday plants require a little bit more special care than a normal house plant. And you know, that could be by design, I really don't know. Maybe that's the reason why you throw them away because they're so hard to get to rebloom again. But let's talk about some of the reasons why you would want to keep them. One is, is to keep your gift. I mean, maybe your mom or your grandmother gifted you a, a plant and you want to keep it alive for that reason. Maybe someone's passed away that has gifted you that plant. So then that plant's got some sentimental value. So um, Christmas cactus has always come to my mind when I talk about that because it seems that I run into a lot of people who have a family Christmas cactus that has been passed down generation to generation from, from grandmother to mother to daughter, uh, that type of thing. Um, also, too, you want to keep your investment. Maybe you're buying holiday house plants, and maybe you don't want to spend an extra $100 next year, so uh, you can keep your plants alive. Cuts down on waste. I mean, that's a big thing for me. Um, environmental things, you know, you're keeping stuff out of the landfill. Saves you money each year, um, so you don't have to buy those plants. Uh, makes your living space better. I mean, you know, uh, multiple studies have been done over uh, the last few decades to prove that house plants improve indoor air quality. Um, also to just human psyche, you know, house plants make humans feel happier, especially in the wintertime when it's drab and dreary to have some green in your, in your house. So that kind of makes you feel a little bit better. It's a fun and challenging hobby. Biggest reason why Chris right here likes to grow house plants is, is it is a challenging hobby. And you can also maintain your plant's health too, just to keep it happy. So poinsettias, that seems to be the number one big Christmas plant that most people think about poinsettias Christmas cactuses. Um, <clears throat> poinsettias, uh, and when you buy them in the store, are nice and red. There's some other collars that are coming around, but they're nice and red, and those leaves are what's red, not the flowers. Uh, the poinsettias do flower if you've ever paid attention, but they're very small flowers. Uh, they're not very pretty. So the reason why we're using them for holiday foliage is because of that red, beautiful, deep red leaves that they have. Um, but, fun fact here is those plants do not produce those red leaves all the time. You have to put them in a dark out period to get those, to get dark, uh, turn red like that. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But poinsettia is like a sunny spot south facing window. So if you've got a poinsettia you've had for two or three weeks on your desk in your office or sitting around your fireplace or whatever and it's starting to look a little peaked, more than likely it's got low light level at that case. So you want to move your poinsettia towards the end of uh, the holiday season towards a nice sunny spot in your house if you plan on keeping it alive. South facing window, east, south, uh, even a west facing window may work in certain, uh, if you don't have trees blocking anything. Um, you want to keep it slightly dry between watering. So number one rule when we talk about house plants is I always tell everybody there's two types of gardeners in the world, overwaterers and underwaterers. So um, usually um, if you fall in that category, you either overwater or you underwater. So a lot of times I tell people who can't grow plants, hey, we need to figure out which one you fall in and then get a plant based on your habit of watering, either under or over. Uh, poinsettias like to stay slightly on the drier side, so you always want to go up to the first part of your knuckle, right here, this first part of your knuckle. Stick your finger in the soil. If your finger comes out of the soil and it's dry to the touch, and there's not much dirt on the tip of your finger, and you don't feel a lot of moisture in that top inch, inch and a half soil, it's time to water your plant. That's what I've done for years, and I've never had a problem with that. I, it's, it's, it's really simple. Your finger can really help you uh, gauge that. But you want to keep these poinsettias kind of slightly dry. So when you water them, water them until water pours out of the bottom of the pot. Stop. Set it back in its tray. 
and then you want it to dry out in between watering. So you want to make sure when you stick your finger down to your first knuckle that it comes out pretty dry, then rewater until water comes out again. If you can keep that up, your poinsettia will be happy. How often will that have to happen? I cannot tell you that. Everybody's house is different. Depends on if there's floor registers, the type of heat that you're doing in your house, forced air gas, radiant heat, wood burning stove, all of those things affect the humidity and the dryness of those pots. So that'll be something you'll just have to learn on your own. The key is to use your finger and make sure that um, the soil is dry before you water it. Once the leaves or the bracts, and poinsettia is those leaves that you see come out three, that come out on each as a bract, uh, fall off the plant. Once the leaves fall off the plant, cut the stems below the flowers, and this usually happens in the winter. So if you've taken your red poinsettia and you've set it in your window, February, March rolls around, you're going to start to see those leaves start to die down and drop off. That's normal. And you will see those little clusters of flowers that I was telling you about. They're real small. Um, once the leaves start to drop, just cut the stems right below where the flowers have, have came out. And that's all you need to do and pull off the dead leaves. And then just keep watering it uh, in between, uh, letting it dry out, and then watering it, letting it dry out, and watering it. Once the outside temperature is above 50 degrees, so now we're probably pushing up into about the 1st of May, end of April, you can take the plant outside and put it in indirect light. So that's kind of nice, uh, which means you don't want to set it out in the south-facing side of your house where it's getting beat with sun. Set it on the side of your house, the eastern side of your house, or the north facing side of your house and that'll be enough for indirect light. You'll get that morning light on the eastern side of the house and it's not as intense as the afternoon heat as you know but the plant will live outside for the rest of the summer like that. Um, you can um, Plants will regrow new, uh, new leaves, which will all be green. So you'll start to see the new green tips come off the tops of your poinsettias. The new leaves will come out and they'll just be a bright green. They won't be red at all. And you want to fertilize with half strength fertilizer. You're going to hear me repeat that over and over. And we'll talk more about that towards the end. But when I say half strength fertilizer, if it says one tablespoon to a gallon of water, then a half a tablespoon of gallon uh, or to a gallon of water. That's what you need to remember when I say half strength fertilizer. Um, you want to bring the plant back inside around the 1st of September. Okay, now I know that we're still warm in West Virginia, and this fall we were warm all the way up until roughly about this week. Uh, we had a few cold snaps, but nothing that was terrible. But you want to bring your plant in in September. And during this period, at the 1st of September, is when you want to start it in 14 to 15 hours of dark. Now, I bet you're probably thinking, man, I'm just going to throw that poinsettia away and go buy me a new one. That seems like too much work. It's not as bad as you think. You just kind of got to get yourself trained in a habit to take it out of its dark place every day and put it back in its dark place. So here's what I would recommend you do. Depending on what size your plant is, go to Lowe's or Home Depot, or if you've got something in your house, and buy a box, a cardboard box. And take that cardboard box up and set that cardboard box over that plant. Um, you know, it can be 14 or 15 hours of dark um, <clears throat> You know, you can start at noon in the day and, and, and go all the way up until, until late in the evening. What I usually like to do is tell people around, you know, depending on your work schedules and things like that, you just got to give it 14 to 15 hours. So what I would recommend you to do is before you go to work in the morning, slide the box over your, your plant and uh, let it set like that for 14 or 15 hours before you go to bed. You can take the box back off. If it's still facing up against the window, it's gonna get a little bit of moonlight and some maybe ambient light from, from lights outside. That's fine. The plant's not going to get hurt setting in the dark. What the plant's gonna do is those green leaves are now gonna turn that deep red collar, and that's what triggers them. So in the greenhouse industry, the 1st of September, all these poinsettias are in blackout greenhouses. So they roll curtains inside the greenhouse to block out all the sunlight, and that's how they keep them in their dark period, and then you buy them at Kroger or Walmart. Um, plants should be all red by November. So if you start at the 1st of September, you're September, you're October. So you've got about eight weeks of keeping them in 14 to 15 hours of dark. After that period, you can take that box off, put it away, throw it away. Your poinsettia should be nice and red and ready to display for Thanksgiving and Christmas. After the holidays, you just repeat that same process over. What I would recommend is going into the second year of your poinsettia is to repot that poinsettia into a little bit bigger pot with some fresh soil, and that way it's got a little bit of home to grow bigger. And, you know, if you guys are really successful with this, you can get some pretty large and in-charge poinsettias, but remember, you've got to have a place to keep them in the dark. So if you get them too big, a box may not work. You may need to use a closet or a, a garage or a basement that's got a dark place that you can uh, turn light and exclude the light out of. 
But the poinsettias actually are a very, ter uh, very terrific night, uh, um, house plant to grow. Um, I like to keep them around. I don't have any right now. Uh, we did have one at the office for a while, but it finally succumbed during the COVID. So I probably need to pick one up. So we've got one back in our inventory. Also too, guys, if you've got any questions, just go ahead and comment at the bottom and um, I'll answer those as we go along. I meant to mention that when we got uh, first got it started. Amaryllis is one of my favorite uh, holiday house plants. There's several varieties of these out now. I remember when I was a kid, red and white seemed to be like the only thing you could get. Now there's multiple collars and they've got stripes on them. There's several companies that just specialize in amaryllises online now. So, you know, the sky's the limit, but they all are kindly treated the same way. Um, so they're going to bloom. You know, you get your amaryllis bulb, you put it in your pot, you put the potting uh, media in there, you water, and it grows and it blooms in your house during Christmas. If you've got to that point, now it's after Christmas, and the flower's starting to drop off, what do I do with that bulb? Well, what you want to do is after the flower drops off of the plant, you want to take a nice pair of pruners, and you want to snip right at the base of the bulb, up on the neck of it, about, about an inch up above the bulb, and just cut that flower stalk and throw it away. Now, the green leaves will still be there. You want to leave those leaves alone. You just want to get rid of that flower stalk. Place that on a sunny windowsill. That can go in the south-facing, east, or, or west-facing windowsill as well. And water the plant, but don't let the bulb or roots become soggy. So here again, use your knuckle on that finger and make sure that that soil is dry but not overly dry before you, you water these again. Remember, it's a bulb, so if you keep it soggy in your house, it's going to eventually rot inside that pot. And that's, that's usually the number one problem with people who overwater is they rot these bulbs out. So that will be the biggest challenge you probably have through the winter after you get it in a sunny windowsill is just making sure that you water your amaryllis bulb just enough to keep it alive, but not enough to rot it or cause root rot issues. Once again, just like with the poinsettias, once the ambient air temperature stays above 50 degrees, and when I say when I say above 50 degrees, I mean 50 degrees at night. You need to be above 50 degrees for your low time temperature. Obviously, if it's 50 for the high and 35 at night, that's not going to work. So when I'm saying 50, you gotta make sure it's staying above 50, even at the lowest part of night, three, four o'clock in the morning. Um, and you can leave it outside and water it as normal, just treat it like a regular house plant. Once it's outside in its pot, you guys know like anything else, it's going to dry out, so it's probably going to require watering maybe every day, at least every other day. So at this point, you don't have to worry about rotting that bulb so much once you're outside in the summer heat. Um, in mid-autumn, so mid-autumn again, we're looking about the second week of September, first week of, uh, of October, right in that period. You want to bring your amaryllis back in. So right about the time that we're, we're getting cold and we're starting to get some chilly nights, you want to bring that back in and you want to cut all the green leaves off. Now, a few more green leaves have probably grown through the summer, but you just want to come right here to the top. This is an amaryllis bulb. You want to come right to the top and you just want to cut everything off. And the only thing that should be sticking out is this little bit of a neck and the bulb is down in the soil. And this particular bulb, this is a five inch clay pot. This thing's about three and a half inches. So it's about baseball size. This is a large bulb I've had now for a couple of years growing. Um, after I get done with you guys today, this evening, I will probably add some water to this. This is completely dry and get this thing started growing for uh, Christmas and the, and the new year. Um, what you want to do is after you cut those leaves off in the autumn and you bring the bulb back in, you want to gently pull the bulb out of the soil or you can leave it in its clay pot. Now, if you've got a plastic pot or a metal pot or anything like that, you're going to have to take it out. But if you've got a clay pot that your amaryllis is in, just bring it inside and set it in the closet somewhere. Set it in by your towels or wherever in your linen closet and just let it completely dry. You may want to put something underneath it so no dirt sprinkles out of the bottom. But I don't know if you guys can see or not, but this soil is, is really dry. It's cracked around the side. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, you want that bulb to dry out. Now, I'm playing around with this right here a little bit because <clears throat> uh, traditionally a lot of amaryllis uh, care stuff online will tell you to take the bulb out of the soil and then place it in wood shavings or something like that to let it dry. But I'm playing with the clay pot. Since clay's porous and this soil is, is, a, is a soilless media that I've got it in, it's a, it's a peat base, it's very dry. I just left the bulb in the pot and I'm going to water this and see if it'll generate. This is a lot easier to me than having to pull it out in the fall 
clean all the soil off and put it in a shoebox. I think this is going to work just fine. I've been checking this bulb for the last couple of weeks and it's still firm, it's not rotted. I think this is going to work for me. But you wanna let that bulb dry in a dark place. Obviously, if it's in soil, it's in a dark place. And you wanna let it sleep there with no water for 10 to 12 weeks. So you bring this guy in second week of September, first week of, of, uh, of October, and you pretty much let it dry up until right now, about the 1st of December, 10th of December, in that period. Now, whether you're letting it dry in the soil or in a shoebox with, with wood shavings, that's up to you. And basically what is going on is that bulb will look just like an onion. It will dry up, it'll have the dry skins on the outside, but the bulb's resting. It's been pulling in nutrients all summer long that you've been feeding it outside and, um, you know, growing. So after that bulb's good and dry, put it back in fresh soil, back in a pot, and just give it a little bit of water. And you don't want to overwater because remember, the bulb's not active yet, so there's no roots in there. So if you keep adding water, the plant's not going to be sucking any of the water out of the soil, so it's going to be a stagnant environment. So go easy on the water when you first start. But then you're going to start to see a little bit of green come up. And a matter of fact, as I pull this back, I see my first green tip. So obviously my, my uh, idea worked by keeping it in the pot because right here's a green tip, guys, coming out off the bulb already. That's fantastic. Um, you want to start giving a little bit of water until you start to see those green leaves start to come up. Once you get those green leaves that are about an inch tall, that's when you want to fertilize with half-rate fertilizer is what you want to do again here. And then your plant's going to grow and you're going to get an amaryllis flower and then you can repeat that process again and again year after year. Now, if you go into bigger pots with these guys, which I very well may repot this into a bigger one, just like other bulbs, this thing's going to divide. So about year two or year three, you should have a whole second other amaryllis bulb. You can have two or you can share that with a friend or family too, which is kind of neat because you can say, hey, I've been propagating or I've been growing bulbs off these, uh, off my run at amaryllis and doing divisions for family and friends for you know, the last 10 years. That's kind of cool too, I think. Norfolk Island Pine, guys. You see these at the holiday time, a lot of times they put glitter on them, which I'm not a really big fan of spray glitter on plants because they don't look really good glittery in the middle of summer. But they'll put bulbs on these and different Christmas decorations. Be careful when you go buy them. I have seen some people glue the bulbs on the tips. Once again, they're intending for that plant to be tossed away at the end of the holiday season. I have a problem with that. So when you go and pick these guys up, make sure that it doesn't have anything on them that you can't get off at the end of the holiday seasons. But I absolutely love these plants. I've had these my whole life since I've been a kid. If you've never, ever messed with one, they're very soft and uh, they're kindly fuzzy. They look like they would prick you a little bit, but they don't. Um, not a true pine at all. Norfolk Island pine does not grow in Norfolk in Virginia. It's a tropical plant and it requires a lot of high humidity and a lot of water. So it's complete opposite of what we would consider pine trees here in West Virginia. They do not like cold drafts. So if I had this plant right here near this door as this door opens and closes all winter and that cold air is busting in if this plant was setting in this general vicinity it would start to get brown tips on it does not like cold drafts very much like a citrus tree i haven't seen too many tropical plants that that do like cold drafts most of them will start to show some type of environmental symptoms of uh, browning they need at least seven hours of direct sunlight. So uh, once again, this is going to have to go in the southern part of your house in a southern facing window. But there's some other things we can do. We'll talk about that in a minute for your plants. But this needs a nice south facing window that likes a lot of sun. I have a sun porch here. My blinds are drawn right now. It's cloudy, but on a sunny day, it's a very bright room out here. This plant does like it. Now, the humidity does drop in here in this old uh, house. I got a 100-year-old house, so the humidity levels get very dry in the wintertime, so I'm constantly spraying these guys with uh, water uh, at least once, if not twice a day, to keep them a little bit happy. I usually keep the spray bottle right beside of them, so that way when I walk by, I can just grab the spray bottle, spritz it. It takes like four seconds. Um, fertilize April through October. So right now we're not fertilizing this guy because, you know, it, it does, it, it, it realizes that we're in a winter period because obviously we don't have 14, 15 hours of daylight. We're right around seven and a half, eight hours right now. And this plant knows that, but uh, so it's not going to put off a lot of new growth. A lot of the, the light green growth you see is what I picked up here in late fall, late summer before I brought my tree back inside off my, uh, my deck. Once again, when you do fertilize April to October, this should be outside at that point. You don't have to take it outside, but I would recommend you do it. They, they prefer it better. They love West Virginia's hot, humid summers. But fertilize with half strength again, guys. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more why, why I tell you to do that, but uh, fertilize half strength with this. Dynagro 795 is a very good choice for general house 
uh, fertilized food for all your plants. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute too. If the limbs do become brown um, halfway up, it's a sign of overwatering. So this tree will actually kind of trigger if you're overwatering. You'll start to see these limbs here on the lower part about halfway up the tree just turn brown and dry and you can just break them right off. That's a sign that you've overwatered, okay? If you start to see some of the branches and on the limbs start to die back. And right here's a perfect example. I've got one right here. I don't know if you guys can see what I just picked off or not, but that right there is a good sign. That tells me that my plant's got low humidity. Well, I already kind of know that. So this, like I said, this sun porch is not, is not very forgiving with humidity in the wintertime here at my house, which is why I have to spray it. So if all the limbs are dying from the bottom up, it's overwatering. If you're just getting branches coming off each little limb that are starting to brown and turn down, that's a low humidity. So you need to make sure if you're growing these North Fork Island pines that you know the difference between those two symptoms because those are the most common ones that, that we run into. Um, brown on the lower limbs during the winter is normal. So if you've got your first two first two sets of limbs down here on the lower part of your plant, if these start to brown and drop off, don't get too worried yet, even if you're like, I'm not overwatering that plant. You very well probably aren't. But like I said, the plant's responding to a low light situation. These lower limbs aren't getting as much sun as they did outside during the summer. And the plant is like, okay, I'm going to abort my lower limbs and put all my energy up here to where I can catch more sunshine. So that's why as long as the top of your plant looks healthy, you can lose some lower limbs. You'll gain those back uh, next year when this tree grows another foot or so. Um, remember, as these things get taller and taller, you know, you're going to have a little bit of trunk showing at the bottom. The limbs aren't going to go all the way to the pot, nor would you want them to. Um, they are toxic to pets, but not deadly. So I do want to point that out. Like if your dog or cat does eat this, uh, you're probably going to have some uh, foamy vomit somewhere, probably on your favorite rug in your house. That's usually how it works here at my house. Uh, but uh, it won't kill your pet. So if you like a North Fork Island pine and you're like, well, I'm worried about making my pet sick, it'll make them a little sick, but it's not going to kill them. You're not going to have to go to the vet. But I definitely would put it someplace where uh, Fido or, or uh, Fuzzy's not going to come and, and eat your, your plant. I know cats love to get in a mess with this stuff. So dogs will usually try it once or twice and leave it alone. I know cats continue to seem to visit stuff like that. Christmas cactus. One of our most uh, popular holiday uh, house plants. I had a Christmas cactus up until this summer that I had for almost 10 years and I lost it to a mealybug infestation that I did not catch until it was obviously too late. I uh, feel real bad about that um, and um, I'm kindly bummed. I was going to buy me another one this year, but I think I'm just going to wait and kindly mourn the loss of, of the one that I had for over 10 years. But there are people who have Christmas cactuses that are pushing over 100 years old right now. Uh, go online, there's, there's forums for Christmas cactuses. It's kind of neat. I kind of think it's kind of fun. Probably everybody out there probably has a grandmother or aunt who's had a Christmas cactus when they were a child, remembers their grandmother had the biggest Christmas cactus they've ever seen in their life. There's over 200 cultivars, and most are hybrids now. So when I say that, that means man has went in and bred to get some of the fancier collars and stuff. That's okay, it doesn't hurt anything, but it's nice to know that there's over 200 varieties. So there's actually more than just a Christmas cactus. There's a Thanksgiving cactus and an Easter cactus too. They look almost identical. The only thing difference is the shape of, of, their, of, their, uh, of the plant structure. But if you know what you're looking for, you can tell the difference, but they will bloom. There's some that bloom around Thanksgiving, some at Christmas, some at Easter. I would expect over the next few years with breeding and hybridization, you will probably see a repeated blooming Christmas cactus that may not even require a dark out period. I'm keeping my eyes peeled for that. There's a lot of love for Christmas cactuses and a lot of breeders that work with them. After blooming, stop feeding the plants. So this doesn't make a difference if you've got one that's a Thanksgiving or a Christmas, okay? They all kindly of have to be treated the same way. But after the blooming, after all the blooms have, uh, have fell off, stop feeding the plant and cut the watering back by half. So if you've been giving it a quart of water, give it a half a quart of water and quit giving it food for two whole months. So after those uh, blooms fall off. So that should get you up until about March, okay? You wanna keep the humidity up because once again, Christmas cactuses aren't a true cactus. They're a tropical plant that comes from Brazil out of the rainforest. They actually like to grow up, up in trees where a limb comes out of a tree or that crotch those moss and leaves will collect in that crotch of these giant rainforest trees and those Christmas cactuses work their way in there through seed and the wind blowing and, and birds and things and they actually like to grow high up in a tree. So Christmas cactuses are very suited for hanging baskets and I don't see a lot of people put them in hanging baskets, but man, they do great in hanging baskets. 
They love to be up high. But you got to keep the humidity up. So remember, in your house, the higher your plant is, the drier the air is. So once again, you're going to have to get that spray bottle and come through and spray it at least once a day, every day through the winter months to keep it happy. Um, around March 15th, you want to start giving it fertilizer again. Once again, half rate. Um, you want to resume the normal watering schedule uh, with the first feeding. So remember, from Christmas time or after your Christmas cactus stopped blooming and the blooms fell off, you've cut your water in half all the way up until about March 15th, the 1st of April. And then you want to start your normal watering schedule again, so water fully and also water with half uh, strength fertilizer. Prune or pinch off the stems at the leaf nodes. So I don't have a Christmas cactus here, but um, there's, there's a picture here on the next slide if you've got it. But as you can see, each little leaf comes off. You can just take your fingers and pinch that and pull that off and that's how you prune them. Or you can actually stick those cuttings in dirt give them a little bit of water, and they'll actually re-root and grow you a second plant. So Christmas cactuses propagate very easily, so you can make up a lot of plants and give them out for Christmas time. Um, that's, that's sort of a cheap, fun Christmas uh, gift idea. You want to remove the cuttings, can be planted in the soil, and they, they will root you can share with your family and friends. Move your plant outside in the summer months. Once again, guys, I used to keep house plants in my house in the summer. And I recently, over the last five, six years, have started taking the bulk of them outside, and they have responded so much better. Um, they just love the sun and the humidity. Most of our house plants, again, are tropical, so in West Virginia summers, they absolutely love it outside, so I can't stress it enough. Get those guys outside, but remember, you're going to have to probably water a lot more once you move them outside in the heat of the summer. Allow your plant six to eight weeks of cooler days and nights, not below 35 in the fall, before you bring it back inside. These cooler days are needed to set buds. So here's the two things that make growing a Christmas cactus difficult if you want it to rebloom again. So we don't want to go below 35. If you go back on the National Weather Service's website and look at historical data here in, in your area in West Virginia, obviously if you're in the Canal Valley, you would look up Canal Putnam County, but if you're up in Fayette County, you'd want to look at that because your elevation is going to change things. But you can go back and you can start to look and see when we start getting these cooler nights. We forget year after year, but you know, we had several nights in, in October that were, you know, in the 30s, the, the high 30s, 37, 38. As long as it doesn't go below 35, you need the Christmas cactus needs the 40 to 35 temperature to set some buds, okay? If you don't give it that temperature, it's not going to work. Now, how do they do it in commercial scales? Well, if they're in a warmer climate, a lot of times they'll put these guys in coolers and refrigerators and chill them for a while. Um, I don't think that's going to work well for you. You could absolutely do that, I guess, in your refrigerator if you want to dedicate a refrigerator. Your wife or husband may not like that, but it's better just to let it set outside in the late fall when we're getting those cool nights, and you'll start to see those little buds form, okay? Once you see those buds form, in the late fall, you want to bring that, that cactus back in. So when the weatherman calls for nights that are going to be below 35 over and over and over again, that's the time that you need to bring it back inside. But here again, you've got to have a 14 hour dark out period to get those blooms, those buds to bloom. So you need that cooler temperature outside to set the buds. And then you need to have a dark out period to get those uh, buds to bloom and get those pretty flowers that we all see. So once again, you got to have it 14 hours of dark. So we have to use a box again or a closet again. So these are the things that a lot of people don't like to keep these. Now, what happens if you don't do any of this? nothing. You'll just have a beautiful big green Christmas cactus or Easter cactus or Thanksgiving cactus. It'll continue to grow and look great with its green foliage. It'll just never set flowers or buds. So there's your downside. If you want to go the lazy route and you just like the look of the plant without the flowers, then you can just treat it like a, a typical house plant. But if you want these flowers and you want them to open up, you've got to get those cool nights in, in the low 40s and high 30s for a few nights to get those buds set and you've got to keep them under a box or in a closet for 14 hours a day. Um, now, once the flower buds appear, move the plant to its holiday display. So you're going to see those buds are going to start to grow and grow and grow and grow and big and they're going to start to open up just like any flower bud. When you start to see them peeking and opening up, that's when it's time to bring it out and display it wherever in your house and then for the next few weeks it will continue to bloom and have those beautiful blooms on it. Once again, keep this plant away drafty areas during flowering. So if you've got a door, if you've got leaky old windows in your house that are kindly drafty, that's not going to be a good place to set that plant. 
Um, also, too, you don't want to set them near floor registers. Um, you know, that dry heat blowing out of your floor register actually will dry the plant out and cause some issues, too. When you've got a plant that wants high humidity, putting it near your forced air floor register is kind of like defeating the purpose because you're getting that warm, dry air right on top of your plant. So think about those things. Um, for years and years and years, I remember when I was a kid out here, people say, all oh, Christmas cactuses are poisonous. You know, you can die if you eat them or your pets. It's not true. They are not poisonous to pets or to humans. Now, obviously, if you ate copious amounts, they're probably going to make you sick, but it tastes so nasty, you wouldn't get that far. But if your dog is caught nibbling on one or you see it caught in their gum or on their tooth, you think, oh, God, if I just went and ate the Christmas cactus, what do I do? Nothing. He'll be fine. <clears throat> Rosemary. Now, here's a plant that, that I've gotten arguments with over people over the years. It's a Christmas plant or not. Rosemary is, is a Christmas plant. You will see it marketed as a Christmas plant, although we buy it and grow it in our gardens uh, in the uh, spring of the year, too. I like rosemary. Um, you know, I will bring my rosemary in and out. Like, I just keep it going and, um, you know, keep it as my herb. I use it in my house plant. If I'm cooking something in the kitchen, I just go over and cut some off my rosemary plant. So I kind of like having it around. But... It smells great, as you guys know. It kind of looks like a Christmas tree a little bit, so you can decorate them. You'll see some rosemaries out there with little bulbs and lights on them. I've seen that done. Um, you want to place your plant in the south-southeast windowsill. So once again, rosemary needs a lot of sunlight. Um, water every three weeks. So here, you can kind of put this on a schedule. It's okay if your rosemary dries out a little bit. It's okay if you can pick the rosemary up out of the pot and the root ball is attached and all the soil is dry. You just don't want to go for long periods of time like that. So every three weeks in your house, every two and a half, three weeks, water it until water pours out of the bottom, set it back in its tray and forget about it. Um, you want to fertilize with half rate. So once a month you want to fertilize your, uh, your trees. So if you're watering every three weeks, every other watering, fertilize at half strength fertilizer. You also want to mist it because they like high humidity. And also a good thing about misting all of your house plants daily will keep spider mites at bay. I can't give you any more sound organic insect device of any other insect that, other than spraying water to keep them away, but spider mites hate moisture, which is why you rarely see spider mite infestation in your landscape in West Virginia in the summertime. Yes, it happens, but very, very uh, limited. Most of the time, spider mites are a bigger problem for house plants in the greenhouse industry because they come in our greenhouses and houses in the wintertime when we've got dry, low humidity air, and they get on these plants and they attack. If you spray them every day with, with distilled water or even chlorinated tap water, not only is that going to help your plant and keep it alive and happy, but it's also going to keep spider mites away. And spider mites are kind of a nasty bug because most people don't know they have them until they actually see the webbing in the plant. And usually by that time, the infestation is so bad that you're going to lose your plant anyways or you're going to have a really challenge at getting it healthy again. Um, you want to keep it above 30 degrees. So the rosemary can fall below um, um, <clears throat> the uh, to, uh, freezing point, sorry guys, freezing point a little bit, and it's not going to hurt. Now, you don't want to keep it continuously out there in freezing, but how many people here uh, have been told that rosemary is an annual plant, doesn't grow as a perennial in West Virginia? And I bet some of you are out there thinking, yeah, yeah, mine comes back every year, and other people are saying, no, every year I plant and it dies. That's right. Two reasons why. One, there's different varieties out there. So some rosemary is hardier than other rosemary, so it's going to withstand those colder temperatures outside. Number two, depending on where you plant your plant. If you've got it up against the house and it's the southern facing side of the house, you've got a little microclimate there in the wintertime. It keeps that ground just warm enough to keep those roots happy. So, you know, if we went further north, rosemary really doesn't overwinter very well. Pennsylvania, New York, and further up because it gets too cold. But here in West Virginia, we're right on the cusp. Some winters it can, some winters it can't. So put it in a pot. Bring it in your house. Use it as a house plant. That's what I would recommend you guys do. Uh, Tuscan Blue and Spice Island are probably the best culinary varieties out there. So I bet you was asking, well, Chris, there's a million rosemary plants. Yes, there is, guys. But Tuscan Blue and the Spice Island seem to be the best for culinary purposes. Now, as far as for growing, there's some tougher ones out there that are more hardy. But, you know, I eat my rosemary. So I want to make sure that I've got something that's got a lot of, of taste and flavor to it. So those are the ones that most professional chefs prefer. Move it outside in the summertime. Once again, when you start staying above 50 degrees, you can take the points that, or take the points that take your rosemary out. Matter of fact, you can even take it out when it's in the 40s. It's going to be okay if you want to get it out of the house. But it's a fairly, fairly hardy plant. But I'm a fan of having rosemary as a, as a Christmas plant. Holiday plant care. 
So guys, I know there's a lot of other holiday plants out there. We could name several other ones that come to mind like paper whites and things like that. But I tried to pick the top four or five that, that, that most people um, encounter at Kroger or the supermarket. But we were talking about that half rate fertilizer. Fertilizer companies love to make money just like any other company. So they want you to use fertilizing. But I promise you, if you start cutting all of your fertilizer, I don't care if you're using Miracle Grow or whatever, start cutting everything by half. Whatever it says on the bottle to mix into how much water, cut that by half. Start feeding your plants that. Email me, call me in six months, and tell me that if I didn't give you the best advice of your life, your plants will respond so much better. To they don't need as much fertilizer. They're just like us humans. We, we usually overeat, and we overfeed our plants. We overfeed, overfeed our pets. So, you know, we've got to get ourselves trained to think that, you know, we don't need that much nutrients to keep these plants happy. Matter of fact, most plants tend to do a little bit better if they're just slightly stressed a little bit, slightly stressed a little bit. They, they tend to perform better. So cut your fertilizer in half. Donagro, 795. This right here is the best fertilizer I've ever used. This is not organic fertilizer, okay? If you're into organics and that's what you want to do for your house plants, I recommend Fox Farm products or Neptune products. But I use both. On edible plants, I usually use organics. On house plants, I will use chemical uh, synthetic fertilizers. But this Dynagro is great stuff. You can use this for all of your house plants. You can use this for your garden plants even. So you can buy this in giant jug or this little small jug. Green Steed and Seed here in the Charleston area actually carries Dynagro, but you can order it offline off several companies. Uh, give this stuff a shot. This is an American fertilizer company. Um, fantastic stuff. I, I just cannot say enough about it. I'm not endorsed by the company. I don't get free products. I wish I did. But I've just used a lot of fertilizer and I've got 25 years of plant growing experience. And I'm telling you, this is the best chemical fertilizer I've ever used is this 795. Um, if you've got bromeliads in your house, so when I say bromeliads, you know, most of you guys, you'll see them at Lowe's a lot of times. A pineapple is a bromeliad. Some plants respond better to foliar fertilization. So bromeliads are one of them because when you water and the water sets down in the bottom of the leaves, it sets and the plant absorbs it. But there's also other plants like your tomatoes and peppers can do foliar sprays. This 936 Dynagro foliar spray, love this stuff too. Once again, half rate on the foliar spray. These two fertilizers right here can go a long way for all of your plants needs if you want to go that route. Me, I own a lot of different fertilizers. Like I said, on vegetables, I do organics and on house plants and, and flowers and bedding plants, I'll do chemical just because they're growing so quick. They respond better to some of the chemical fertilizers. No matter when I mix up my fertilizer in water, I always want to add Super Thrive. Big fan of this. This stuff's been around for almost 100 years, guys. This is basically uh, probiotics and for, for your plants. So whatever the fertilizer doesn't have in it, you add a little bit of this. So I add this to all my water. Even when I'm not fertilizing, I'll put a little bit of Super Thrive in just my plain water. And that's just vitamins is all it is. It's basically uh, chewable gummy Flintstones for your plants, guys, in liquid form. Love this stuff. Make sure that you uh, pick up a bottle of that. If we've got darker plants, we've got rubber trees, we've got mother-in-law's tongues, even North Fork Island pine in, in some cases, you always want to pick you up a, a bottle of chelated iron. So what I'm pointing out here is what you need to buy as a houseplant parent. These are some, some of the important things you need to get. So you need some fertilizers. You also need to get some chelated iron, okay? Uh, I got this at Rural King a couple weeks ago, $8.00. Uh, the last bottle I had of this took about three years to get through it. So you don't need a whole lot of it. It's very little. But those really dark house plants, they love a little bit of iron. Also, if you're growing citrus trees, they love iron too. So go ahead and make sure you got a bottle of this laying around your house. It's always uh, useful. Once again, guys, you need that spray bottle to spray those plants. Um, spray bottles are a dime a dozen, and boy, oh boy, is the technology all over the place. Would One would think a spray bottle is pretty low technology, but I'm going to tell you right now, spray bottles are not created equally. I don't really have a favorite one. I go through several spray bottles before I find one I like, and then I use that, and then finally the spring will wear out, and I can't find it again, and I'm on the hunt again. But uh, make sure you've got a spray bottle that's comfortable for your hand, that doesn't tire your hand, because remember, you're going to be spraying these plants every day. And get one that you can spray upside down. A lot of the cheap bottles 
once you get so far down, they're just sort of blowing air. A lot of the horticulture spray bottles that are marketed for horticulture use now can be turned up any way, any way, and they're still going to pump and pull water in. I love those because you're just not spraying up here. You've got to get up underneath the plant too, guys. So when this bottle's land like this and you're sucking air, you're going to be frustrated. So get a good spray bottle. Get a good quality spray bottle. Clay pots. You guys see all my plants are in clay pots. I don't hardly have any plants at all that aren't in just clay pots. And when I say clay pots, I'm not talking about the nice ones that are green and yellow that's got the glazing because that acts just like a plastic pot. It has sealed all of the pores in the clay. A lot of people don't like clay pots because of the discoloration that comes through. Those are the salts and the fertilizer that works its way through this porous clay. I don't mind that. I kind of find that nostalgia myself. But if it bothers you, you can take these pots to your kitchen or bathtub with a stiff bristle brush and go around them a couple of times every couple months and those salt stains wash right off. But why I like clay pots is it's porous. The roots are inside here. Air is making its way through the side of this pot as we talk. When you water clay pots, you'll notice the clay gets wet. That's because it's porous. So the plant roots respond better. The, the pot dries out more evenly. Plastic pots, can be a death sentence to a lot of plants, especially if you're somebody who overwatered because they're inside that plastic and that plastic just holds all that moisture in and causes root rot issues. So go back to the old fashioned clay. These pots are still cheaper than most of the fancy pots out there. They look good. If you do want to decorate them, you can paint this, the, the lip up here. Just don't paint down here where the roots are. But you know, some people will spray paint this or glue things on there. I've seen some pretty, pretty stuff on Pinterest. By all means, rock and roll and, and, and go that way if you want to. Just don't close this up. But I love clay pots. I know that they fall over, they break, but they're inexpensive to buy. Um, I'm trying to get everybody to fertilize at half strength and get away from plastic pots. That's my goal in life. Now, the last thing I'll talk to you guys about here is a grow light. Now, a lot of people have heard me talk about grow lights when I've been in the office, and luckily I'm at home today where I've got my supply of grow lights. But... If you've got citrus trees or these holiday house plants and you don't have a nice south facing window or you're in an apartment in the center apartment where it's dark, that does not mean that you can't grow these plants. You're just going to need to invest in a grow light. And there's several out there. There's the T5 light fixtures. They're about $124 for a four foot fixture. Kindly high and they use a lot of power. They, I shouldn't say they use a lot of power, but they use more than LED lights. This right here is an LED light that I got off Amazon three years ago. I think I paid $52 for this LED light, okay? Bloom spec is what it's called. This is a cheap LED, guys. This is, this in, in, in a real horticulture world, most professionals would laugh at you if you walked in with this, okay? But for the homeowner, this light does great. I have grown everything under this light. It doesn't use much power. It's less than one amp, so think of your TV running. It's about the same power consumption. You can plug this into a light timer that you can buy at Lowe's for 10 bucks. Maybe you've got one for your holiday house lights that you can use after the holidays. Put this timer on, hang it over your plants, leave it about six inches above the top of your plant. So you can, you can bring these up and put them on chains and hooks. There's, there's all kinds of different ways you can fasten the light. But just make sure it hangs about six inches off the top of your plant. And let this thing run for eight hours a day. What I like to do is have mine come on at 8 o'clock in the morning, kick off around 5 o'clock. So that way in the evening time when I'm at home, I don't have all that annoying plant light glowing through my house. Now, the cheap lights, guys, this one when it's plugged in actually glows a purple color. And you've probably seen those LEDs. That's the old technology. That was the original LEDs that came out about 15, 20 years ago in the horticulture industries. All were red and blue. We call these purple. Purple lights with a B. Purple with a B. Purple lights is what we call them. Does not mean that they don't work, but most professional growers now are using LEDs that glow just like the sun does. It's a white light like we're used to. So if you want to know the difference between full spectrums and, and not, is basically these LEDs are just designed to give out red and blue wavelengths that plants use, nothing that the human uses, and that's why they're kindly purple. But we have found out that plants use a little bit of all light waves, so the newer LEDs that are coming out aren't purple no more. They're white with infrared technology built in. But this little $52 guy right here that uses very little power for your house plants or your citrus tree that's losing leaves or your North Fork Island pine, you can't beat it. 52 bucks may even be cheaper now. Uh, another company out there. Highly recommend you investing in one of these if you're getting serious about making your plants happy and healthy. Um, that's my trick. Everybody wonders why I keep healthy house plants because I supplement light. That's just plain and simple. 
if I didn't do that, they would look a little peaked in the, in the spring, and that's okay. I'm not saying you have to go buy a light, just know that your plant will degrade slowly in your house through the winter until it gets to spring most of the time, if you don't have a greenhouse or a nice sun porch. Do we have any questions for anything? Okay, guys. Well, I appreciate everybody tuning in today. If you think of something later, feel free to uh, email us or contact us. If you've got the slide, my email and Brad's email information is on the last slide. If not, you can reach out to Brad or, or email us and we'll email you this presentation. And you can always call us or email us with questions later on. Uh, happy gardening and planting, guys. Till next time.